Boa tarde novamente a todos. É, eu queria fazer só um anúncio aqui. Ah, essa palestra não só foi possível porque faz parte da atividade da Escola Avançada de Educação Física, Fisioterapia, Fonoaudiologia e Terapia Ocupacional. E teve o apoio da Pró-Reitoria de Pesquisa da USP. Eu queria que todos que estão assistindo, seja via IPTV ou aqui, é, fiquem atentos para porque haverá mais palestras do Jones. Teremos amanhã de manhã, a partir das 10 da manhã, e aí, logo às 14 horas também uma outra palestra dele. E eu queria aproveitar para dizer que esse tipo de, de iniciativa é que permite a gente atingir um novo nível dentro da graduação e da pós-graduação. Mas é uma pessoa do nível do, do Joe, que se prontificou a vir, ele é um homem extremamente ocupado, e se prontifica a ficar quase 15 dias aqui com a gente e o tempo inteiro ele está à disposição. Já fez reunião com alunos, já deu palestra no Instituto Federal para os engenheiros de lá, com alunos nossos também envolvidos. Então, realmente é, é algo que a, a USP consegue oferecer para vocês. Eu estou vendo pelas perguntas que vocês fizeram, que é, inclusive vocês se prepararam para ver aqui. Então, parabéns e vamos para a próxima palestra. Joe, thank you again. And now we have our second lecture. When I decided to come to uh, Brazil this time, uh, uh, Luis Moshizuki um, asked me if I would talk about um, writing the grant. And I said to him, I, I don't know about grants in Brazil, how they're presented or written. And he said, oh, just talk about what they're like in the United States. And I would expect that there are common things in the United States and in grants in Brazil. Um, so I'm talking mostly about what is expected in the United States. Um, so these are things that you have to do when writing any kind of grant. Um, in the United States, there are two kinds of grants that you normally, well, actually, three kinds. One is a federal grant. One is what we call a foundation grant. And the third is an industry grant. They all basically take the same form. So I'll talk about federal, but they're all basically the same together. One of the things that you have to start off with is a well thought out question. If you don't have a good question, no matter what, the grant is not going to get funded. Okay. What I mean a good thought of question is you have to think really well and get a good topic. Now, one of the things that is getting more and more prevalent in the United States is the topic should be integrated. And what do I mean by integrated? I mean, if you can't, it's difficult now almost impossible to get a grant with just biomechanics. It has to be biomechanics, motor control. Biomechanics, motor control, maybe physiology. Or biomechanics and epidemiology. You know, it has to be integrated. You can't just do it by yourself anymore. Secondly, because it's integrative, you have to assemble a really good research team. As I said, you're not going to do this by yourself anymore. The next thing that you have to do is a very thorough research, uh, literature search. Now, you know, you often get into a situation where you think that this is a unique topic. And then you do a literature search and you find out someone's already done it. Um, that happens all the time. But if you're going to continue on with that topic, you have to do it better. And you have to bring something new to it. And then what you have to do now is have pilot data. You know, sometimes people say, well, you have to have the study done before you get the money to do the study. Well, that's sometimes true. But you have to have pilot data. So when you have all of, the, all of this done, 
you actually collect some data that you will put into the grant. This does one of two things. It helps you develop the number of subjects that you need. It also helps you tell whether the idea is feasible. And it also helps the people who review your grant um, give you an idea that they can actually do it, that you can actually do it. So, and this is the hard part. There's a, a huge amount of paperwork that you have to do in addition to what is in the grant. Now, um, we, we sent out to you um, a grant. This is the grant. It's about oh, 60 pages. Okay. Only 12 of these pages are the grant that I wrote. But you notice all of the other pages that you have to deal with. And it's always good to get these going right away. Get them going right from the beginning. Now, in our school at the University of Massachusetts, we have a person whose job it is to help you prepare all of that other stuff. Okay. Now, I don't know what you have here, but it's good to get that thing going right from the beginning. The next question is, how long does it take to write a grant? Well, it depends. Big federal grants, it takes about six months, at least. The smaller foundation grants, you can probably do in one or two months. Okay. The industry grants, you can probably do in maybe a week or so. But the big, I'm talking about the big grants now. And when I say a big grant, a big federal grant, I'm talking about anywhere a million dollars plus. So, these are the kinds of federal grants that there are, and there's a whole bunch of them. Um, what you have to do is look them up on the website, and um, you know you can get them. Um, you'll see they're called R01, R03, R15, R21, and they all do different things. The R01, this is the big one, and it uh, supports a discrete specified circumscribed project. Okay. It's a big grant. And most of these grants will be oh two to three million dollars. They're also difficult to get. Okay. Um, last year my, one of my colleagues and I submitted two R01s. And what you do is you get a score and a percentile rank. We missed getting funded by this much. Just a little bit. Okay. I think we were one or two percentile ranks off being funded. But that might as well be the Atlantic Ocean, the width of the Atlantic Ocean. Because we didn't get funded. And what was really interesting was we resubmitted the grant and got a worse score from the same people. So, and you, at the time we submitted it, you only get two chances. Now you can resubmit it more than, more than twice. But um, this is a small research project. These are only about $150,000 a year for three years. This is a, 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 what they call an enhancement work. If your university doesn't have a lot of funding, you can go for these. These are, again, very, very small. Maybe $75,000 a year for three years. This is, I think this is a really good one. This is exploratory work. You know, they call it apple pie in the sky with no chance of ever developing anything. It's the only time that NIH will allow you to do this. Now, I should have mentioned National Institutes of Health, all of these grants have to have something to do with health. And they're, it's called the National Institutes because there are many institutes. You know, there's the Institute for Aging, there's the Institute for uh, Neuromuscular Research, there's the uh, Institute for Musculoskeletal Research, there's the Institute for Child Development, things like that. You have to make sure the grant goes to the right institute. Um, now, that uses 
the National Science Foundation, which is the sister foundation to the National Institutes of Health. Unfortunately, they don't get as much money. And this is to do with pure science, nothing to do with health. If you send an application to NSF, anything to do with health, they'll just send it back to you. Um, and, you know, they have all sorts of programs from anywhere from graduate students, undergraduate students, rather, to um, postdoctoral fellows. And the one nice thing they have is for small business programs. So you as a researcher will collaborate with a small business and get a grant to develop a product. It's a very nice program. And these are the areas that they um, you know, support. You know, anywhere from biological sciences, to engineering, to economics, um, math uh, math mathematics. We've had a couple of these grants, and they all had to do with um, the whole notion of uh, coordination of movement. And um, those are the types of grants that, you know, you could think of these as being very basic science, and NIH as being very applied. So there are all sorts of applications. You know, you can have a new application, a renewal. As I said, um, we submitted this, got a good score, submitted this, got a worse score. Um, you can do a revision, okay. um, you know, an extension of a grant. Sometimes you get a lot of money for the grant, but don't get it finished in time, so you have to apply for an extension. Um, continuation, a change, and these ones here are basically more handled by, not by you directly, but by the, your institution. But there's a lot of different applications. And you have to think very hard about what type of application and what type of grant you're going for. Okay, so what's the process? First of all, you have to plan. You need time to plan, organize, and write the grant application. As I say, a big grant application, you know, six months is a minimum. It could be as much as a year to get everything together and ready. And by the way, there's always a deadline for these grants. When the deadline comes, if you don't meet the deadline, the grant gets sent back to you. And it's a very hard deadline. What you have to do is find a funding opportunity. Now, NIH is pretty easy. They advertise all the time. You just go onto the NIH website and see what's available. And if your idea fits with what's available, then that's where you go. They have what they call uh, FOAs, Funding Opportunity Announcements. They also have things called RFPs, which is a request for a proposal. So they're asking people to submit to the FOA. Then you have to apply. And there are the appropriate application forms. Using the instructions for the forms, you have to be very specific. For example, it's so specific that they measure the boundaries around the page. They have to be exactly correct. The font that you use okay, in your grant application has to be, um, it can't be 10 font. Can be really small. Um, I think it has to be 11 font, which is slightly bigger, and I think it has to be area. So you submit something that's say Times New Roman and 12 font. They'll send it back to you. They just reject it. You have to be very specific, and you have to put the grant on the specific application pages. And all of these are provided to you. Um, as I said, in this thing here, all of these are very specific application pages. And I think this was all set up so you can look at this and see. By the way, this is one of the grants that 
didn't get funded, and when we resubmitted, it got a worse score. But anyway, I'm not very bitter about that at all yet. Okay. And then what happens when you submit the grant, you get a receipt and a referral. And there's a department that goes this. And what they do is they look for all of the things that are wrong technically with the grant. They don't deal with the content of the grant. They just deal with the technical things, as all the things that I just mentioned. Now, this is what they will do when they receive the grant. They check to make sure it's complete. All the pages are there. It determines the area of research. Okay. You can tell them you want this to go to the National Institute of Aging. But they may say, well, no, it fits better over here. So they'll send it somewhere else. They assign the application to a specific institute or center. They assign a number, and they assign it to the review group. And there are multiple review groups. Okay. So the grant submission, the whole thing takes about four to eight months. And you can only submit the grants twice a year. And what they do is they overlap the, the submission dates so that you can't get the grant or submit the grant one, get the results and resubmit it again the same year. You practically have to wait a year to resubmit it. And it goes to a scientific review officer. He looks at the content, checks for completeness, manages conflicts of interest, and this is very important. And he recruits reviewers and prepares summary statements. So, well, the interesting thing that I've always thought was kind of strange is the people that review your grant are the ones that are doing air research in the same area, and they're actually also competing with you for grants. They probably already have a grant, but they will be competing with you. And the scientific research grant is a panel with a chair and a whole bunch of reviewers. And what each reviewer will do, and you have three reviewers for each grant, they will prepare a written critique based on review criteria, and they will judge the merit of the grant. And then the reviewers will assign a score. And that score then, all of the grants is turned into a percentile. Okay. Now, last year at NIH, they accepted only grants in the top seven percentiles. That means 93 per, uh, um, percentile ranks did not get funded. That's very, very low. So this is what the reviewers are looking at and you have to pay attention to when you're writing the grant. What's the overall impact? The assessment of the likelihood for the project to exert a safe, powerful influence. <clears throat> Significance. Does the project address an important problem or a critical barrier to uh, progress in the field? <clears throat> Investigators. Are the PIs or collaborators and other researchers well suited to the project? <clears throat> For example, if I submitted a project, let's say on cancer, the odds of me getting funded are so that none because I don't do cancer research. No matter how good my idea is, if I can't do it, if they don't think I can do it, then they won't fund it. Even if it's a good idea. <clears throat> Innovation. Does the application challenge and seek to shift current research or clinical practice paradigms? They want to know, are you going further? Does the idea take you further than 
what, what is already established. This is a difficult thing to, to judge because sometimes your idea can go too far. And I can give you a very good example of this. Many years ago, we started doing work in an area called dynamical systems. And we're very interested in coordination. And we submitted a grant. And the people in the review said, what are you talking about? You know, we don't know anything about this. There's not been enough papers. Well, we had only published one or two papers at that time on this area. And so we didn't get anything funded. Now, I can submit grants, and at least they know what coordination is, and they know what dynamical systems is. As I said, sometimes you can be too far in front. So you have to judge exactly where you are in the whole area of research. And then they evaluate the approach, the strategy, the methodology, analyses. Um, can they accomplish the specific aims of the project? They also, the environment. Do you have the laboratory facilities to do the study? If you don't, why would they fund it? And then there are other criteria, uh, protection of human subjects, inclusion of women, uh, if you don't include women in the study as your participants, you have to say why. Minorities, children, vertebrate animals, biohazards, and all of the rest has to be addressed. And then they have other review considerations, applications from foreign organizations. People from Brazil can apply to NIH as long as you have an American co-investigator with you. But it, you know, it does get hard when you're from a foreign country. Um, you know, resource sharing plans, sometimes NIH will say, okay, we'll give you $100,000, but the university also has to give you $100,000. And sometimes universities don't like doing that. Um, and the budget sometimes comes into question. Usually you ask for a five-year budget, and then you'll ask for probably $300,000 a year, or $1.5 million at minimum. They may say, well, you can do the study for 1.2. Why do you need 1.5? And you have to justify that. And then, of course, what you get is a summary statement addressing all of these points. And they use a nine-point scale. Each one of these points gets a scale from one to nine. I can tell you right now, unless you get ones and twos in everything, you're probably not going to get funded. So, what about the grant? Now, this is the grant. Of this, you write basically 12 pages. The rest is, you know, filled out by someone helping you with all of these additional pages. So, when you submit you have a cover letter, in this letter you say, I want this to go to the Institutes of uh, Aging. Of course, they may say, no, it goes somewhere else. You can ask, but you may not get. Your specific themes. This is the most important page. This is one page. This thing. If you cannot convince the reviewer in this one page that your grant is worthwhile, they probably won't even read the rest of the grant. One page. What's on this page? Well, there's probably about two paragraphs that try and set up the whole idea. Okay. Let me just try and Okay, um, our first statement. The overarching aim of this research is to address the role of gait mechanics in the rehabilitation of musculoskeletal overuse injuries in younger adults. And then we go and talk about the current state. The second paragraph 
basically addresses the specific injury that we're talking about. Anterior knee pain is one of the most common overuse injuries in otherwise healthy adults, both active and sedentary populations. So we have one paragraph talking about that. The next thing, as a first step to uh, examining the motor system response to pain and the implication for gait modification intervention, this study will evaluate the impact of a 30-minute run stimulus at a preferred and increased step rate on self-reported pain, gait mechanics, and movement coordination. And so we have a paragraph describing that. And at the end of that last paragraph, we say, um, you know, we were going to address the following outcomes. And we had three aims. Three aims. And then with each aim, I can read you one of the aims. To evaluate the effect of a 30-minute uh, run at a preferred cadence on self-reported pain, gait mechanics, and movement coordination in younger adults with symptomatic anterior knee pain and matched pain-free controls. And then we had one, two, three hypotheses. Then we had another aim, and then a third aim. And then, uh, because this is printed off on different sized paper, we had a statement at the bottom. The last statement was the impact. Probing the impact of pain due to overuse injury on the flexibility of the motor system to adopt new movement patterns in the presence of pain is a first step in understanding the potential for movement re-education interventions to provide predictable and clinically relevant impacts on both overuse and chronic knee injuries. All of that, one page. In this case, it's one a little bit. But if you cannot convince the reviewer that it's worthwhile in this one page, the rest of it is done. As I said, they probably won't even read the rest. So, <clears throat> the next thing that you have, this very important thing, is budget. Actually, the budget usually comes in down here, but I put it up here because it's very important. And then this is your research plan. So the only things that you have to consider are the specific aims and the research plan. And you get, for an R01, you get 12 pages to do that. If it's an R03, you get, or an R15, you get six pages. So the maximum is 12 pages, no matter what. The minimum for some of the grants is six. So what do you have to do in this research plan? What's the significance of the idea? What is the innovation? And then your approach. You have a rationale and support for outcomes. So these are all your dependent measures. What is your study design? I should uh, put in here too. Um, within the study design is, um, you know, your participants, and what you have to do is provide a rationale for the number of participants. Study design methodology, how you're going to do that, and then your hypotheses that you state here. What are the what are the hypotheses? What do you expect the outcome to be? And then you have this part here, it's called timeline and milestones. When are you going to start collecting data? When are you going to start analyzing? When are you going to start writing papers? When are you going to finish the project? And then, this is always interesting, what are the limitations of your study? Are, if there are any. And then, what happens if nothing works out, what happens if the intervention that you're trying to do doesn't work? What are you going to do then? So you have to come up with an alternative plan. Now, this is the only part of about 60 pages that you're responsible for. If you take out the budget here, take that out. This is the only thing that you're responsible for 
got to get that solved in 12 pages, or in some cases, six pages. And as I said, um, we sent you a copy of a full grant with everything. Well, actually, you see the cover letter here. The whole thing. So this will give you at least an idea how to do it. But the most important thing is um, specific games, as I said. If you can't convince the person with that one page, you're not going to convince them by reading the whole thing. And one of the things that you have to do for all of the investigators is to provide a bio sketch. And the bio sketch basically, you know, what the person's credentials are for doing the study. So if you have five investigators, you put five bio sketches in. So these are the additional things that um, you know are not actually part of the, the they're not the part that you write, but they, they have to go along with the grant. It's your bibliography and references, and you have to address the if you're going to use animals or not, um, any other contractual arrangements, facilities, inclusion of women, minorities, and children, multiple PIs, and resource planning. Some of these, you know, uh, like for this, I usually say not applicable. Um, and this, I usually say not applicable. That's all you have to say if you're not going to use them. Writing tips. Make the goal realistic. You know, don't say you're going to cure world peace. You know, because you know it's not going to happen. Um, you just have to make whatever you're doing realistic. Be organized and logical. Write in clear, concise language. Don't try to be flowery. Or, you know, you're not writing a novel. Okay. And this is, you have to sell your idea. Remember, these people are not going to be talking to you. If you haven't written it down here, it's not here. What, I, I like to edit the thing myself, but I also get help. You know, I have in the past hired someone to look over my grant and say, you know, make sure there are no English errors in this. Make sure there are no spelling errors. Because if you have a whole bunch of spelling errors, that turns people off very quickly. And especially if it's in this specific names page. Oops. And share comments. Get comments from colleagues. We have a group at the University of Massachusetts where I can take my grant and say, here, would you read this? See if it makes sense. And they can do the same thing. They'll give it to me and I'll read it. So, share the comments. So, in writing the grant, preparation. That's the key. And this was a, a comment that one of my colleagues made. Is good writing can be misunderstood. Great writing can never misunderstood. Okay. You never want to be in the position where the reviewers have misunderstood what you wrote. And to be successful, you have to submit a large number of grants. Um, you cannot take it personally when you get a rejection. Um, I can tell you, many years ago, over a, a two-year period, I did nothing but write grants. I wrote 10 grants over a two-year period. And do you know how many I got? None. Not a one. The following year, I wrote one grant. And I got it. And that it works out, it was, it was a $1.75 million grant. But after 10 of them, in all rejections, I could have been very 
And I'm not going to submit that to Greg. And some people will actually do that. But I was persistent enough that I submitted one more. Luckily, I got it. So never be discouraged. Keep trying. Okay. Like I said, I based this off on the types of grants that you write uh, in the United States. I can't believe that they're that much different for Brazil, but hopefully this helps you. And again, oh, this is a different well, That's These two are the same. That's the graduate school uh, where the graduate dean sits. And believe it or not, that is a six-story building. It's just that it's on a hill. So the other four stories, and then this story is actually story five, and that story six. Do you have any questions? I would concentrate on getting 
um, France and Brazil first. When I have a track record of being able to get grants in Brazil for my research, in other words, let's say I get two or three grants from Brazil, then I would start going to foreign organizations. But foreign organizations are not going to fund you unless you can get money in your own country. So, you know, um, you have to be able to get money in your own country, then go outside. That would be what I would suggest. I, I also would like to say, at the University of Massachusetts, most of our graduate students, most of our PhD students, will write grants. And they will try to write grants to get their own research funded. Now the grants range that they will write range anywhere from $5,000 up to $100,000. But some of them actually do their research need funding. Um, so what I say here applies to graduate students as well as faculty members. Okay. Questions? Uh, do I have a question? Uh, you said a couple of years ago you tried for two years, ten grants got none. Then you tried one and got that one. And well, this happened after decades as a researcher. And you you have a, a big name in biomechanics, and still you might try and not get the grants. Oh, yeah. What what would you say about the the newcomers? Let's say new researchers on the age over 35, below 40 years old. How how can they get grants, or should they collaborate with researchers, senior researchers like you? Well, that's a good way of doing it, collaboration. Uh, you know, the the key thing here is that you have to have a track record. You have to show the granting agency that you're capable. And they can see that you're capable when you have had some success in grants. Um, maybe you start off as being a collaborator. And then you start submitting grants on your own. With those 10 grants, I, admit, I think uh, I was probably a bit pushy in the sense that I was the PI on all of those grants and um, I probably didn't have a good enough team and I would hope my ideas were good enough but um, you know, it was I think I, I failed to follow my own advice in many instances you know but starting off um, and this is how graduate students um, actually get, end up getting um, faculty positions as being a collaborator on a grant with their advisor or mentor. Um, and then possibly writing grants on your own. You know, um, some of the graduate students say, oh, it's a lot of work to write a grant for $5,000. Know? And it is true, it's a lot of work. But if you get it, you know, you can put it on your resume and you've got a grant. And that helps ultimately when people are looking at you, your resume you know, when you're applying for a job. And, you know, it helps faculty members when they say you know, you've got lots of grants um, when they're applying for a job too. So. Another thing, uh, I, I had the pleasure myself to be in your lab and I saw uh, very nice equipment and the lab is big. How long? Did it take from you to have all of those stuff in the same place and running as nice as it runs nowadays? How many years to get long, long time. No, I, nothing is built overnight. You know, um, you know, when you get a job at the university, uh, very rarely will the university give you millions of dollars to start up a lab. They may give you a little bit, and then you have to build on that. But um, I was lucky enough that I had um, several industry grants. 
And industry grants are different. They, they give you a little bit more leeway on how to spend the money. You know, um, so what I was able to do is because I had these industry grants, I could buy equipment out of those industry grants. And then um, you know, I would get federal grants as well and foundation grants. So I could use the equipment to, the, to do the industry work, but also to do the foundation and uh, federal grant work. So, um, you know, it took a while. I, I would say probably at least 15 years. Do you still do industry work? Yes. Yeah. Uh, could you give an uh, example uh, of industry work that you have done the past years and if possible, how much money it brings to your life? Um, well, since most of my work um, in my research has been in lower extremity uh, during run and walk, um, and I've been looking at injuries, a natural thing was for footwear companies to come and ask me to do research to make sure that their footwear would not injure anyone. And, um, but recently, um, a footwear company came to me and, and said, would you do research to come up with a whole new different way of analyzing running and walking and how this whole new way could help us make better footwear. And so that was a, like a dream uh, being had. And, um, so, um, I, I generally say that the industry grants have provided me with, you know, anywhere from one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars a year, of which I would say forty percent of that would need to buy new equipment. So, uh, because. The University of Massachusetts has never, they've never given me one dollar to buy new equipment. It all had to come out of industry money. But then I've always had federal money on top of that. And one of the things that we have to do is uh, we have to pay our graduate students. And the graduate students get paid to work at the lab. So, I have a big project to do. I would hire three or four graduate students, and they would collect all of the data, do all of the analysis, and I might go to lab to say hello sometimes. But most of the time, they would do everything. Um, and because our graduate students have to pay tuition, I also have to pay their tuition for them. And because we do not have socialized medicine, I have to pay for their medical too. So each graduate student costs me, each PhD student probably costs me $40,000 a year. The graduate student only gets about 20 of that. The university gets the other 20. But if you think, you have five graduate students, that's $200,000 right there. And then I also have two postdocs. And the postdocs cost about $50,000 each. Money, you know, goes up very quickly. Any other question? Uh, the inclusion of women and minorities on the grant was meant to be on the research team or a subject of a research? Both. It's always you know, it's really sad that, you, you know, um, women scientists in the U.S. have been terribly underrepresented. Okay. So it's, you know, you, it's not, a, you don't have to, but it's nice to do that. The inclusion of women uh, in terms of participants, you know, um, like for example, if you're looking at um, neo-osteoarthritis, you know, it's obvious that you have to include women because women 
more and more women at the Austin are threatened to see men do it. So why would you want to look at men? You know, you want to look at the population that has, um, that you can get the most information on. Um, so, I mean, in one case you don't have to do it, in the other case you have to explain why you're not doing it. It's dark. And what's the actual experience to evaluate uh, researchers in the United States, like each index, like species in life science? I'm, so, I'm sorry? What's you... the practice to evaluate uh, researchers in the United States? For example, number of the patients or... Uh... Um, it depends. Um, the, there, there's no absolute metric. You know, it doesn't matter about the number of publications that you have. What matters is where you have them and the impact of those publications. You know, biomechanics journals generally do not have very high um, impact scores. Um, so that turns out to be not important. But, um, it's the number of citations that the uh, paper has. You know, uh, the, the gold standard is usually once you get over 100 citations for one paper, that means it must be a really good paper. If you get 200, that's even better, and so on. But um, the key thing is the right papers that have a lot of impact. And the impact in terms of the number of citations is the gold standard. But then again, you know, at, at some places um, in the humanities, it's totally different. In the sciences, what I've said usually is the, the key. Um, in the humanities, it's the number of books you write and how important those books become. I will tell you that writing a textbook uh, means nothing. So. You know, even if you write a textbook, that doesn't count. Hi, Joe. Uh, uh, it's a kind, kind of, uh, I don't know about the ethics of this issue, but I will say anyway. Uh, here in Brazil, when we apply for a grant, we are aware that besides the research, we'll have to deal with uh, a lot of bureaucracy. You know, uh, we will get the resource, but uh, it will be difficult for us to import equipment and to install, install the equipment and to administrate our, our staff and, and so on. So, not me, but it's very common practice to apply for a proposal that we had already done, you know? So you use the resource to make something new and then you just fire your reports you're going to be to the something that you have already done by, for what, I don't know, with, with what resource. Uh, is it, does it happen in the US too? Yes, yeah, it does. What uh, do you think of it? Well, I mean, it's the nature, um, you know, a lot of people say that, um, you know, you write your, especially your pilot data, you know, your pilot data, um, in many instances, is the study. And you submit it as pilot data to get money to a study you've already done. Now, you're technically not allowed to do that. You might enhance the data a little bit more. But most of the stuff, most of the hard work is done. As for bureaucracy, we have probably as much bureaucracy as you have. Um, and if you see what I said about the number of times your grant gets viewed once you've submitted it, um, there's a, a, a huge amount of bureaucracy. In my last position, um, before I retired, I was the Associate Dean for Research. And um, I, have, I used to have to make decisions all the time. Um, you know, a person comes in with their grant one day late, and I'm not submitting it. You can't submit it. You're one day late. You know, one hour late, even. You can't submit it. You know, 
Um, so I was part of the bureaucracy too, and uh, and it gets worse. You know, you know once you um, we have a, an office just for grants and contracts. Once I look over the grant, it goes to grants and contracts. They look over the grant. Then it goes to the lawyers, and they have to look over the grant. You know, so there's so many levels. The bureaucracy, it, it's just ridiculous at times. Yeah, it is. Well, thank you. You know, I will say one of the things that I find most depressing about this whole procedure is the amount of time that I used to spend writing grants. You know, uh, you know, seven, you know, for some years, I would spend 60% of my time writing grants. And my students used to laugh and think it was funny when I actually came to the lab because I didn't have time. You know, I just told them what to do and they did it. So, which is not good, but that's the thing that you have to do. Yeah, I got a question. Joe, thank you again. Thank you for our question. Uh, so, para encerrar, obrigado a todos pela participação. E, por favor, fiquem de olho no, no Facebook, que nós temos ainda mais 12, número na final, 12 outros professores convidados que participam desse mesmo programa que é incentivado aí pela Corretoria de, de, de Pesquisa. Obrigado a todos pela participação e até amanhã.